very good to see you. It feels a bit odd being here in this absolutely beautiful place um, and, and, you know, so Scottish in some ways to be speaking about England, but um, uh, they thought it would be a good idea. And I have done the talk both in um, Edinburgh at the Fringe and in Glasgow um, because it, in some ways this is a book few people expected me to write. Um, and that's always a good thing. I'm a journalist, as some of you might know, and I write a weekly column in The Independent. And I just wanted to explain why I wanted to write this book. And there were um, three reasons. One is political, one is deeply personal, and one is a story of an encounter with a stranger. The political reason um, was the rise and rise of UKIP. In, in UKIP seems to me an English movement. I know there are some UKIP members in Wales and there might even be a few here, but largely it's a movement of Middle England, it seems to me, and, and now increasingly working class <coughs> English people. And this was my response to UKIP, because um, I think those who are seduced by these messages um, have to realize that their story is bigger than the one that UKIP is selling them, that the story of England is not what Mr. Farage says it is, that little Englandism is actually a travesty of England's story. So I'm, I've used the book as a kind of political riposte to this narrowing of the English imagination and heart. Um, I felt it was important to tell the story of England's openness from the 16th century, from the moment the boats went out. England was expansive in the way it thought about itself. Shakespeare named his first theatre The Globe. What does that tell you about already what this, what they were thinking of as Englishness? Now, the problem was, that of course, that led to conquest and exploitation and occupation and all sorts of things. And I am part of that story. I was in the empire, brought up in the empire. But at the same time, there is this extraordinary openness. The um, encounter with the stranger uh, I kept getting foul emails from a member of the English Defence League. He would send me these emails every two or three days, and they were truly repulsive emails, saying, you know, my country has been a whore, and it left its legs open, and you are the bastard children and what they were going to do to me and my children and to my English husband, who was a bastard. You know, it went on like this. And then it would always end with a line, and you are a coward because you won't have coffee with me. And this went on and on and on. So I finally said, so I finally said okay, we will have this coffee. I will have coffee with you for one hour. And after that, and I will pay for mine and you pay for yours, I never want to hear from you again. And if you say that to me in an email, I will meet you in central London on this day and we'll have this coffee. So I did. So we had this coffee and he carried on in the same un very unpleasant way. But I saw him now. He was in his 30s, well-dressed, sounded very educated. You know, that's all I know. He wouldn't tell me details. So uh, after an hour, I said, fine, we're done. And as I got up, he grabbed my arm. And I was kind of rattled by that. And I was wearing my wedding bangles. When uh, Asians get married, they have wedding, gold wedding bangles. For Ramsey, I can't remember. I had my wedding bangles on, four of them. So he grabbed them and he said, I like those bracelets. Where are they from? And so I laughed at it. I said, look, even you, even someone like you 
cannot resist the lure of the Orient, the glitter of the Orient. You see, it's in your blood, I said. And I walked away and I thought, I had to tell the story of the English, you know, how they cannot resist the Orient. <coughs> and the personal reason is quite moving because it's, it's well, it's a bit, bit connected to some of the things that are going on now. I, I'm a Muslim from a Shia uh, Muslim community, which is a sort of subsect of Shia Islam, which is already a minority um, uh, branch of, of Islam. And the sect I belong to, uh, we are Ismailis, and we are hated by mainstream Muslims to the point that they won't let our dead be buried in their, in their graveyards. So I went to my mother's grave. Um, she's buried in um, a beautiful burial ground called Brookwood, which is in Surrey, um, very, very Middle England. And um, I was walking around and I saw that not only did we have a plot, but there was a plot given to Zoroastrians and there was a plot given to um, Ahmadi Muslims, who are all another sect, who are also murdered and hated and killed in, in most Muslim uh, nations. And the last time I was there, there was even a plot given to Latvian airmen. So it was a kind of mosaic of the dead in this very English place. So I started thinking how interesting, you know, that for all this kind of rhetoric on migration and diversity and national identity, the English have found it in their hearts to kind of shuffle up and make some space for us, really, as they do in queues and surgeries and so on. And that this is an extraordinary story. So I explored the area and I found a mosque in Woking nearby, the town nearby is called Woking. And it's a beautiful, perfect, old, traditional mosque with a dome, gorgeous, but now in the middle of an expanding kind of residential area. And the story of the mosque was extraordinary. It was built in 1888, opened in 1888. And from my research, it was the first purpose-built mosque in Europe after the Moors were banished. And when I looked at the story of the mosque, the architect was English, Mr. William Chambers. The builders were all English, a local firm. The backers, some of the funding came from the Queen of Bhopal. A, one of the movers and shakers in all of this was an Orientalist, uh, a Hungarian Orientalist, whose name is, I won't remember. But it was also backed by some very upper class people some of them who were in the Lords at the time, and were converts to Islam. So there were thousands of converts to Islam in that period in Britain, and many of them were upper class. And I just and one of them was Lord Stanley of Alderley Edge. Now, if you know Alderley Edge, it's where the footballers' wives and silly women like that live now. But <laughs> at one time, it was, you know, this man had converted, and actually some of these lords are buried in the same burial ground as my parents are. So it just made me think there's this story of England that I really want to tell. And my mother, who was a devout Muslim, but she also drank wine. And she was a very good person, because she didn't lie about it, and I'm the same. But um, she, when she met my husband, my ex-husband had walked out on me, and I was in a terrible state, blah, blah, we came from the same background. And she met my, I met my second husband, my present husband, an Englishman, at a railway station. And um, when I introduced her to him, she said in our, my home language, which is Kachi, what are you doing with this guy? Look at his hair, he's got girl's hair, he's wearing an earring and a pink shirt, and do you think this man is going to look after you? You know, these people, she said, don't understand family, okay, maybe at Christmas, but really. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when she died, when she died, she said to me, she had, she, we were very poor when we were growing up, and she had a tiny little pouch of jewellery. 
and she had one pair of uh, go, um, diamond studs. One she, uh, she had lost, so she said, this one is for Colin. I give my diamond stud to him and he must carry my coffin. Uh, the word in our language is kafan. Now this is impossible because ours is a very secretive religion because it's been attacked over centuries. And you can only go into this inner prayers if you're an Ismaili, and you can only carry the coffin if you're... And so I told the elders, well, sorry, this is going to happen. And you, you, you know, you're going to make, have to let me do this, let it happen. So they went away and had their spring meetings, and it happened. So Colin, my husband, who's English, laid down, I get all very teary when I say this little sentence, <laughs> laid my mother down in Brookwood Cemetery, and I wanted to tell this story. So, what is the story I'm telling? I'm telling the story of, in a way, kind of challenging the idea of the Englishman and woman as uptight, uh, cold, duplicitous, um, uh, um, tight, just tight folk, um, uh, intolerant, prejudiced. Of course, all of that is true. And my goodness, I suffer it every day. Uh, you should see, uh, look, look up what, what I, they say about me and to me. But at the same time, there has always been this openness, almost in spite of themselves sometimes. Um, and you, as I said, you look at Queen Elizabeth I, the stories in the book. She was the first um, uh, political uh, leader of, of Great Britain, I don't know if she was of Great Britain, of England at the time, Queen of England, who issued the, the first anti-black immigration edict in this country. So when you want to see the history of anti-immigration ugliness, you have to go back to her because she said, there are too many black amours upon my island and they should be banished forthwith. Too uh, many black. There are too many black. Blackamoors. Blackamoors. Blackamoors was an Elizabethan word which Shakespeare uses yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. And she, I think there were two edicts and which there were. Year was this? Hmm? Which year was this? So 16 something, 15 something or 16 something. It's in the book. Don't ask me dates, I'm very old now. <laughs> but it, it was in her reign, in her reign. So there were black people in England at that time. So when Shakespeare wrote Othello, it was already happening. And there was a pamphlet written in 1578 by a man called George Best, which said, too many English women are taking up with black men and producing these coffee-colored dark children. 1578. It never happened anywhere else in the UK or Europe. So there is a, a stunning story here that the English have chosen not to look at. So when Shakespeare wrote about Othello, he wasn't just imagining it. It was around him at the time. Um, so there she is. She's issued this statement. But the same queen was so enraptured with the Ottoman Empire, partly it was to get up the noses of the Catholic Spaniards. You know, she, It was politics. She wanted to uh, join with the Ottomans to get at the Catholics, but it went way beyond that. She would send her tailors to Istanbul to copy the fashions so she could, you know, be part of this uh, biggest empire in the world. She, um, when those oligarchs, Ottoman oligarchs, came to London or ambassadors, she would order Londoners to come out with bells and torches to welcome them. She had some of them, their portraits painted, um, and she had plays put up for them in, in Oxford and Cambridge. And so there is this, this duality. It's almost like Siamese twins. One side hating the foreigner, the black man, the, all of that, and the other side absolutely enraptured and weak before the stranger and the otherness. And you see this throughout, absolutely throughout. Things I didn't know that are in the book, which I found out when I was writing the book. 
When I used to take my mum to see St. Paul's Cathedral, she would always say, oh, it looks just like a mosque. And I would say, well, don't be so silly, it's a church, you know. But she said, look at it. Well, it turns out, it turns out that Christopher Wren himself described his architecture as Indo-Saracenic, as refined by Christians. And in fact, it was much hated by traditionalist architects, and there are all these things I've quoted in the book, because real traditional architecture was Roman and Greek. European in that sense. And this was, they thought, prissy and effeminate and full of spikes. And so it really pleases me that our House of Parliament is actually an Indian design, really. <laughs> you know, and I think there's something really quite cheering about that. Um, I've looked at the theatre. Um, there were three brothers in Sussex called the Shirley Brothers, S H E R L E Y. And they were great adventurers and traders. So one of them uh, went east and kind of turned into um, a hater of everything eastern. But the other two went to the Persian court and joined the, the court of the Shah. He, they trained the Shah's army, and he then made them Persia's ambassadors in Europe. So they dressed in fantastic Persian costumes, and there are beautiful portraits of the Shirley brothers and their wives. If you Google, you'll see these amazing portraits. So playwrights wrote a number of plays about these extraordinary Shirley brothers and the court of the East. There was even a play written in the 17th century called Aurangzeb by Dryden, where he makes, Aurangzeb was, was like, I was explaining to somebody that Islam seems to go through these cycles. We have an open period, like we had in Spain, in Mughal India, under Akbar, and so on. And then it's always followed by very closed off, uh, puritanical Taliban, Al-Qaeda sorts who come in and, and get a grip. And then we go into another phase, and I won't be alive, I think, when we enter another open phase. But so, we, in India, Aurangzeb is the villain of, of uh, the Mughal story. Here was this wonderful story of the great Aurangzeb and his poor man's dilemmas and, you know, the, the problems of authority and rule and so on. You look at science. And I wrote this book also for young Muslims. Because young Muslims, especially those who are very angry and highly intelligent, have got two paradigms in their heads. One is that they've hated us since the Crusades. And the second one is Edward Said said, you know, the West has always, Europe has always demeaned the East. Now, Said didn't say it in that way. He was a complex thinker. But the way it's distilled down now, and in a way I am challenging Said's um, interpretations in some areas, certainly the Middle East. But, so I want them to read the book and understand that the story is so much more complex than that. And actually, there was a great deal of love. So, 16-something, early 1600s, the first chairs of Arabic are established in Oxford and Cambridge. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the King send scholars out to get manuscripts, especially scientific and, um, or, and, and manuscripts on astronomy back in Arabic to this country because they did not trust the Latin translations. By this time, they worked out that the Latins had it in for Muslims and they were corrupting all the texts, so they wanted to read them. So when the Royal Society was first set up, the first most enlightened great scientists in this country, in, and most of all the English scientists, taught themselves Arabic, I mean, high-level Arabic, so they could read the texts. And there are loads of other stories. Slaves were taken. When, when the English say we were never slaves, they're wrong. Um, slaves were taken during the Great Empire period from the southern coastline of England. And there's a wonderful book by Linda Colley called Cactus. Um, there were pirates, there were official Ottoman uh, Navy people, 
So they were taken to various parts of North Africa and to Istanbul. When Charles II sent a ransom, an ambassador, to the um, Sultan to get these English people back, a third or more refused to come back home. The food was better, the sex was better, no thank you, <laughs> don't want to come back. And so if we did a DNA test <clears throat> along the, the North African coast, certainly in Istanbul, one of the most powerful people in the court um, in Istanbul at one period in the late 16th century was called Hassan Aga. He was a eunuch. But he was actually um, somebody, I can't remember his exact name, from Great Yarmouth. He was an ordinary working class Englishman who had managed to rise and rise and rise in the Ottoman court. India is another example. I mean, William Dalrymple is here and he knows more than anybody else about this. Both the Scots and the English, how they fell in love with English, with Indians and India. Um, like I said, in spite of themselves and often had wonderful um, relationships and families. But it was the cultural thing too that is important to remember. Some of the most gorgeous palaces in India um, uh, built in the 19th century were actually, the architects were English. They were appointed to go and make these grand palaces. There are two amazing in small palaces in um, the Cotswolds in, India, in um, England, just a few miles from where the horrible um, Jeremy Clarkson lives, which really pleases me. Uh, again, you know, he thinks this England of his is the one that uh, is, um, uh, matters. But actually, there are, so one belonged to Warren Hastings, and, and the other one belonged to another East India Company man. They're beautiful. And Sezincote, the second one, uh, John Betjeman wrote a wonderful poem to Sezincote as he was going towards it about the domes and the spires and, and all the rest of it. Um, architecturally, the influence is huge. The influence in terms of, uh, you know, personal lives, the travelers, especially the, the um, desert travelers. Richard Burton is known for his kind of sexual adventures, but actually, when you read his stuff, he was an amazing linguist. He learned, I don't know how many languages. Um, the first white man to go on Hajj to Mecca. Um, and he persuaded Winston Churchill, we were just talking about Winston Churchill a minute ago, who had the most awful attitudes uh, most of the time. But he was a complex man, just like Elizabeth I. Um, he, when I, East African Asians, which is where I, uh, you know, I'm one, one of them, he defended us against the racist um, administrators and white South Africans and colonial um, men and women who had just awful attitudes towards people of color. And he would always defend us. But more than that, he gave the land to Muslims to build their mosque in Regent's Park. This was Winston Churchill's gift to Muslims because Richard Burton persuaded him that, look, there are more Muslims in your kingdom than there are Christians, and you owe it to them to give them, uh, uh, to kind of make a statement that they belong to your empire and you, you, know, you welcome them. And so it is, the story is of, of England and the other is never a straightforward black and white story. I would say Shades of Grey, but I don't say that anymore <laughs> because of that awful book. But it is so complicated. It is so varied. Um, you know, the women's story of Jane Digby, I don't know if anybody here has read about Jane Digby, extraordinary woman, one of thousands actually, who couldn't bear the society that they were living in, especially upper, middle and upper class women. So Jane Digby, who had a lover, a count, a, a, you know, princelings, whatever, never could find fulfillment. So then she goes off to um, uh, Syria. She's in her 40s by now and has created scandal after scandal in Europe. Turns up and in the market, she meets a Bedouin chief who is in his 20s and they fall in love. 
and they live together incredibly happily it seems until she dies so half the year she lived like a bedouin wife in the desert you know no feet and uh, no shoes on her feet henna on her and this other half they had a she had a house built in syria um and you know she just became a bedouin in the way that the english were very good at becoming and when i was researching the book i land on these two points i went to the uh, to um, egypt and uh, i couldn't go into iraq at the time because it was it wasn't safe so i went to jordan where quite a lot of iraqis were and then i went to india so the middle east then i was there in egypt just after mubarak had been deposed and i was talking to people there what does england mean to you now what what does england speak to you and there's a wonderful um um journalist and novelist in his 80s one of their greatest living writers um called um Jamal El Gitani and i went to see him and i said well what does in england mean to you and he said to me oh england my dear england is our minaret and i said well, what do you mean by that he said where we want your liberties we want your magna carta we want your governance we want your freedoms and that was quite touching because all the time i was there including with him the first 25 to 30 minutes was spent on how they hate england because of the balfour agreement and the whole israeli question which is just burns through every person in the middle east but then after all that you come to another place with them and there is this deep and abiding love and one of the things that the iraqi said to me i shall never forget gertrude bell who created an english woman who created iraq was an imperialist a double triple spy all of those things but she spoke several languages including tribal languages she loved iraq and she loved the middle east and in fact committed suicide when she knew time was up and she had to come home um and there was a bust of her a bronze bust of her in the museum which the iraq war you know the museum was more or less destroyed and the bust had gone missing and when i was in jordan they had found this bust um and they were rejoicing they were celebrating and i said to them but you, she's an imperialist what are you and they said listen miss bell knew our heart she knew our soul what did bush and blair know about us and that was really touching and again and again i found this to be true and in india of course there is this amazing relationship which you know has gone on forever but the, for me the most extraordinary uh, uh, discovery was a painter i had never heard of and most uh, british people have not heard of called tilly kettle tilly kettle was a fabulous painter who went off and started painting in india and uh, was killed en route between uh, britain and and india and they've kept his painting they display his paintings at the victoria memorial in calcutta and they are, they they really respect his work and they are extraordinary big pictures of real love for for the indians that he knew um and and the india that he knew similarly um um other painters who went to india and some who went to china and the middle east this is where i think edward said was wrong when he said that some of the paintings of the the white painters in the middle east i mean i just saw um mark's wonderful book on uh, david roberts these people the scottish painter in the middle east these were real acts of love these were not pictures of disdain or exploitation they were real and in a way love that they yearned for they it was a yearning to belong so when they got dressed up in you know turbans and 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 arab clothes i don't think they were saying we can be what we want we own you i think they were saying something very different and then finally so in india i do all this and i meet a group of young people in mumbai to talk to them like i talk to the egyptians and the jordanians see what you, and so there were 
there were the new Indians, very successful, very um, uh, super confident, and so on. And they said, ah, who cares? They took me to a place and they said, who cares about Britain and England? Your time is gone. It's America. America is where we have studied in America, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, okay, tell me who you admire. And I was writing down the list. And they gave me the list. It's in the book. And I, I came to the end. I said, you do know Amy Winehouse is not American, don't you? <laughs> uh, and nor is Martin Amis. And, and we went through the list. And actually, it was extraordinary how many, I would say more than half the names of the people they most admired um, were from the culture that they think is over for them. Um, and uh, uh, Shashi is here, and he's in the book, as is William Dalrymple, whom I interviewed when I was there. The connection is really very deep. So uh, Shashi said in, in a very interesting blog, which I quoted from, that when the English were in India, they named their houses, you know, oh, I don't know, Grasmere or, um, you know, Richmond or whatever because it was uh, wanting to be back home. When they came back to England, their houses were called, you know, uh, Bangalore or Quetta <laughs> or whatever. And that is, I think, different from the Scots. I am suggesting in the book that the English are, have no fixed identity. They, they move between identities. There is, the border is very porous. And I talked to Neil, not Neil Fergan, Neil McGregor at the British Museum. And he said, yes, because the English Reformation, they decided that the church would be eclectic and porous if they were going to take on the might of Rome. The Scottish Reformation went the other way. It tightened up its borders. There was one way to be a Christian, as did the French Reformation, he said. But the, and that's the difference between England and almost every other tribe in Europe. Thank you. Thank you.